Hi everyone. Um, we're going to start our webinar and I want to start by thanking everyone for being here, at least virtually. And it looks like technology is on our side, so welcome. My name is Mary Kay Lambino and I'm going to basically facilitate a conversation between myself and Judith Brody and Nancy Burns. And we're here to basically offer some guidance for mentors for their year-long mentorship. And we'll share some of our experiences um, in both roles. I served as a mentor in 2013-14. And Judith Brody, who is the curator of modern prints and drawings at the National Gallery of Art, served as a mentor in the 2014-15 year. And her mentee is Nancy Burns, who's assistant curator of prints, drawings, and photographs at the Worcester Art Museum. And participants are encouraged to ask questions by typing them in. We might not get to the questions until the end, but feel free to type them in any time, because that will allow us um, some time to either address those within our session or make sure we leave time for them at the end. Um, so type away, ask questions as they come to you. Um, and just as a way of introduction, I want to mention that we're going to cover a few specific areas that we thought would be useful to mentors, and those cover goals, which I know you've already presented your goals, or your mentees have, um, communication, which is extremely important for the success of this program, um, managing up, job training, key elements of success, and of course advice for this year's participants. And in that case, that's when some of your questions will come into play. Um, so I'll get started and we're going to cover goals first. And Nancy, I wanted to ask to start by asking you if you could summarize your goals for the year and explain how you came up with them and also let us know if they proved to be realistic or if you needed to change them throughout the year. Uh, hi, uh, it's nice to be here. I, th I have four main goals, but I would say the most important is somewhat abstract uh, as opposed to being truly very clear and practical. And my biggest issue was that I was having a, was in the midst of a difficult political situation within my institution. And as a junior curator in a department of one with uh, only three curators in the entire museum, I didn't really feel that I was empowered to uh, address the situation with the bravado that I might have wanted to, and I really needed some advice on the best way to deal with a very difficult situation. So in that sense, that's a rather abstract goal, but I think a very important one for all curators, particularly younger curators, to develop, which is dealing with interpersonal politics within a museum setting. And I think that was, uh, I think it was very successful. The, the issue didn't entirely go away. It entered a state of detente, but I think that what I needed most was to develop the confidence to uh, feel empowered to address the situation. Other goals that we had that were a little bit more uh, clear cut, I would say, would be help with how to approach making, uh, making acquisitions, uh, approach meeting colleagues in the area of prints and drawings. Um, another was that funding has been significantly cut in my institution for publications, and so uh, we really wanted to focus on a way that I could try to get publications so that I would be able to join things like the Print Council down the road. And then finally, an area where I felt I needed help was in fundraising because I can be somewhat timid when it comes to an ask. And I needed a senior person to really talk me through these things. I think that I was successful, very much so. Great. And Judith, if you could maybe address how you participated in helping Nancy develop those goals and also um, work towards achieving them throughout the year. Um, Nancy actually developed the goals. I mean, I 
didn't know enough about her situation. I really didn't know anything about her situation. So I leaned on her to define um, what her needs were. And um, when I started, I really probably didn't understand what I was getting into, and I was very impressed with the sort of rigorous approach. Um, and I think that was valuable, um, that things had to be written up, and it helped me. I mean, I had a file, and I recorded everything, so I knew what was going on. But I think the best thing was to just step back and listen. I mean, a lot of just listening, um, and listening to the issues that Nancy had, um, hearing in her voice whether she was panicked or not, um, not necessarily coming up with answers. And I think one of the things I learned to be careful about, or I quickly be recognized, is that every institution is so different. I mean, there's a big difference between let's say, you know, a, a large national museum and a smaller, you know, museum. And what happens here in my institution, I can't assume happens everywhere else or, or necessarily should. So I think it was trying to get a sense of what's possible um, in a um, realistically, you know, let's let's be realistic about um, what we can do and can't do. That's great. I've heard a lot uh, about the listening factor. <laughs> I've heard uh, mentees especially say that having someone who's a great listener is a huge help. Um, so that's reiterated here, and. Um, and I do think that's right. There, everyone has a different set of situations, and it might take a little bit of time to get to know the situation of the mentee, and and that's okay. So if you're a mentor now and you don't feel like you have a grip on exactly what your mentor needs, it will probably come with time. That was my experience. Um, so the next area, uh, the next topic I wanted to cover is communication. And again, I'm going to start with Nancy and ask her to describe the type of communication she had um, with Judith and are they scheduled talks, do they take place by phone, Skype, in person, and what are the pros and cons that you found in that method of communication that you used? Well, I can say that our, our, our conversations were mostly done by email and by phone. I'm, I'm personally a little awkward and uncomfortable on Skype, so it was just something I preferred not to do. Um, but I, I very, because I was dealing with a situation that made me uncomfortable, I think that one of the nice things that Judith did is she really let me kind of drive the frequency of our contact. When things were, when I was feeling anxious or stressed in particular situations, she was very receptive to talking to me on the phone more than once in a week, she would follow up and want to know how something went, if I were stressed, and then maybe we wouldn't talk for another, you know, four weeks or so. But, uh, so I think that in some sense we were always checking in with each other, but uh, I would, you know, or she would say we should probably have a conversation by phone if we haven't talked in a while, but, you know, as I, when I had needs, I found that Judith was very responsive to them. And I preferred to speak on phone if I was dealing with something with a confidential or sensitive manner, because I did not want anything put in email related to that. So uh, that was something that was important to me. I think it was very successful. And, and Judith, did you um, give any assignments to Nancy or any sort of um, help in guiding her thinking um, about her role in her museum, or was your com communication more informal um, just talking about particular issues. Um, I certainly didn't give any assignments. Um, it was generally informal, but I would also say it was pretty structured. Um, it, it, it's very different than mentoring someone 
who you know. I mean, that's the kind of situation where you generally get to know someone over time, and then you decide, hmm, I'd like to be a part of the, this person's success or try to help them along as best I can. This is a little more difficult because you actually don't know the person who you're being paired with. And um, I think the structure helped me in that regard. It kind of kept me on target. Um, but again, I didn't assign anything. Um, I checked in a lot. I encouraged Nancy to pretty much set the program. Um, and I, I, I think one of the things as a mentor, um, particularly you're working with someone who you don't know well, you probably don't know the institution they're working at very well, is to not think you have all the answers or that you could in any way fix things. So I think more than anything, it's giving that person a sense that they have a trusted ally, not that I might say that everything that Nancy would suggest to me, I mean, I might say, hmm, maybe you shouldn't go there. But I think more than anything, it is that sense that um, you can pick up the phone, you can get an honest opinion, um, someone will listen to you, take you seriously, um, take everything in confidence, and um, I'd say that is a good foundation for this sort of program. Yeah, and that I think goes right in line with what Nancy was saying earlier about feeling empowered. Mm -hmm. um, I found that with my mentee when she was actually having a change of leadership during the time that our mentorship was happening and she wasn't sure about how she could sort of you know, go into the new director's office and, and have a conversation. So this idea of sort of empowering you to speak up for yourself and advocate for yourself turned out to be a big issue. Could I just add one more bit? I think that, you know, in terms of communication, the most valuable aspect of this fellowship for me was, and its success hinged entirely on an understanding that communication was confidential. And that's not just in the case of Judith, but also um, Carol Elio, who was our uh, liaison. I, Because I was dealing with a situation that I was very uncomfortable with uh, and was sensitive because I, did not, I didn't really want to be gossiping too much, but I really did need some help, uh, I think that the only way this is successful is if the mentor communicates to the mentee that the situation that it's a, you're a trusted ally, that uh, and it's not even for mentees who might have a difficult situation politically. It could just be saying that it's okay and you won't judge if someone says they they don't have confidence in an area or they don't think they're very good at this one aspect of uh, being a curator. Because the the way this is most useful, at least in my opinion, is if the mentor knows where you feel uncomfortable and where you feel weak, that's when you can actually be helpful, most helpful. But to establish that, the mentee needs to feel like they can tell you and won't be judged for whatever anxieties you have or feelings of inadequacy or anything else. So confidentiality and expressing that, I think, is really important. Thank you. That, that is important. Thanks for mentioning that. And I think also uh, that kind of leads us into the next category, which is managing up, because I think, of course, the, your direct report isn't always a good mentor because you're also being evaluated by that person. Um, and so, Judith, I want to start with you. How did you help Nancy prepare for her annual performance evaluation um, and also clarify her job description, being an outsider as you were? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Nancy, but I don't remember my preparing you for any sort of performance evaluation. It just felt to me that you were always 
evaluating yourself and you were aware that other people were in a position to evaluate you. And so I think it was kind of a constant um, issue, so to speak. Uh, there was one very concrete way in which you helped me, though, which was when I came to the National Gallery, I brought you my job description and we compared it right, right. with another one of another position right. at the National Gallery because they were reevaluating my position description and I wanted Judith help me prepare compare the two. Right. And also for my performance evaluation, she offered me some good questions that I could ask in a professional manner that allowed me to find out how I could get moved to the next level of being an associate. So there was a way you were very concretely helpful. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I do remember that I did look at it, and sometimes, I think a lot of the times, um, Nancy would test ideas um, with me, um, ask me, how does it happen at your institution, um, you know, what our guidelines are, and as I said earlier, I had to be careful because every institution is different, I don't think there's one uh, perfect way of running any institution, um, but there were some things that Nancy brought up and I would sit back and think about and think, yeah, that really is not the standard. You know, you, you do need to have um, some sort of guidelines about such and such. And Nancy was in a particularly difficult situation because she really is running her opera, her own operation, and she is essentially um, in charge of a department, and there's only one person, and that is Nancy, and <laughs> she is an assistant curator. Um, and there weren't, frankly, at certain points, there weren't a lot of other curators around, so she really had some difficult um, passages to get through. Thanks. Um, I think that's one of the things that often happens in these pairings is that um, because they're different types of institutions, you can compare notes on how things are done, but also recognize when a, there, there's a very small staff and when I found that when people are in assistant positions or haven't sort of graduated to a senior curator position, there's also a lot asked of them, so that really they are in a managerial position. <laughs> They're managing an entire department, for instance, often, um, you know, either some interns or an assistant, um, but maybe there isn't as much training in that type of work. And so my next area, my next topic is about job training. Um, some of Nancy's goals were related to acquisitions, publishing, and fundraising, all of which are skills that we're required to know but aren't necessarily taught in an art history graduate program, for instance. Um, but So, Judith, how did you approach those topics and what kinds of knowledge were you able to share with Nancy in those areas? Well, I think I was clear right from the start that I wasn't going to be uh, the best mentor when it came to um, development. I mean, I'm perfectly fine um, working with my donors, but I don't generally have to raise money, so that's very different. I'm not out there trying to fund exhibitions. Someone else is doing that. Um, but with regard to um, one of the issues was purchasing works of art, which of course, you know, that really does come with experience. I mean, that isn't something you can teach someone easily, um, but but you can introduce them to the setting and the people. And so Nancy and I met in New York, and we spent a day together at the print fair, um, and it was interesting for me too because sometimes you forget 
the sort of bits and pieces of information that you've acquired over time just through osmosis. Um, but then sort of seeing it from her vantage point, which is that um, it's a very friendly place, but it could be intimidating. Um, you know, there are all these dealers lined up. You don't know which are the ones that um, are the most respected. Maybe there's one or two that you, I personally have found difficult, and I might share that information. Um, and then the, the various um, specialties of every dealer. You know, this person is really good at old master. Or this person is you know good at such and such. And we did a little as I recall, role-playing that day. I mean, almost my uh, quizzing Nancy, and she took it like a champ, you know, why this work? I mean, she would go to a work and she would say, I like this. And, and that's, of course, the right place to start. I like this. But then, how does it fit in your collection? Or do we really know that this is the best price? Or is this really a priority? Um, and all of that comes with time, but I think her, uh, she didn't have a mentor. I mean, she simply does not have someone in the present institution to turn to, to learn that from. So it was brief. Um, it should have been more, but I hope it was helpful. And what was the third thing that we were just talking uh, publishing? about? Publishing. Publishing. I mean, we talked about that. Um, I introduced her, I mean, I'm not trying to um, skip out of an answer, but I, I wouldn't say that was something we focused on a lot. We talked practically about what you could do and what you couldn't do and get done in a um, timely way. Um, but I did try to um, introduce Nancy to other senior curators, but also other assistant curators, so that she would um, start forging a circle to turn to. And I, and I think the larger your circle is, the better off you are, because someone might be really good on um, some aspect, um, but someone else might be terrific um, on something else. So the larger the circle is, and I tried to expand that circle. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, uh, and uh, I think that one of the things that, that Judith did do in terms of fundraising, which went hand in hand with uh, publishing for me in the end, was I can be timid and uh, uncomfortable to ask money from donors. But Judith reminded me that most people who are donating aren't, aren't going to get angry at you for asking. They will say no if they want to, but they're not going to get upset with you. They expect you to ask. ask. I think that the, the year was all about developing confidence for me. Confidence in terms of dealing with, you know, 23,000 objects by myself. Confidence in terms of feeling like I can go to a dealer and ask the right questions and not feel awkward about asking for a discount and not feel awkward about wanting to know, you know, about this bid or have it unframed and I want to see the back of it. That was an important thing. I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing it if Judith hadn't told me that's completely fine for you to ask to do. You should. Um, I. You know, I managed to secure funding for a part-time print room assistant because I went to one of my donors and just said, I really, really need some help. And I'm, I only have her for six months, but I, it was something, and he said no to longer, and that's fine. And I ended up getting Wham to commit to printing, uh, publishing in-house a catalog for my next exhibition because I got Clark University, a local school, to cover the other half. And then once the university agreed to do it, Wham really felt compelled to put up the other half. So, I mean, I've had to do a lot of workarounds, but Judith, it's really about developing confidence. That's what I really needed out of this last year. And sometimes it's abstract, sometimes it's very pointed, but I think Judith did an excellent job in offering that to me. Thank you. That's great. Um, your mentorship sounds like such a success story. 
Um, and we have a, a couple more things to talk about, but I want to remind all the participants that this is your chance to ask questions. I haven't seen any questions pop up yet, um, but this would be a good time to think of them and type them in. Um, and one thing that was going through my mind as I was listening to you to talk uh, about this success story is that there is a certain, uh, you know, curators as a group are, we're creative people and we're, we have ideas. That's sort of why they hire us for our ideas, right? Um, but then it's one thing to have the ideas and to come up with them and to talk about them amongst peers, but then to have to go and defend them defend them to a board or to um, to your boss or to a someone who's going to write the check and help you achieve that goal is a whole other set of skills that I think does come with experience as you said Judith for sure and does require a lot of confidence um, in yourself and, and to be able to back those ideas and to do it in an enthusiastic way that others will kind of get on board with you. Um, so it sounds like that networking piece also, Judith, was an important part for Nancy. Very, very, yeah. very much so. Um, so that's great to hear. And then the last area that I want to cover is just sort of what are those key elements of success? And also we can touch here on advice for this year's pairings. Um, can each of you name a few of those key elements of, of the successful mentorship? You go first. Okay, um, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but I truly believe that um, a successful mentorship is built on the mentor listening. Um, not necessarily um, patting the mentee on the back constantly and saying, you're right, you're right, you're right. I mean, sometimes I had to pull, pull uh, away because I just didn't know. I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know these players. Um, and it's not that I didn't believe Nancy, but I felt like I had to just not do it for her, but just help her do it mm -hmm. by listening and playing out her ideas and listening especially when things went well and just saying great you know you did that and it worked it's perfect <laughs> um it's just one year i mean i'm sure we will stay in touch um but i think it was uh, a good way for nancy who i think was feeling extremely isolated um to not feel so isolated it was critical in that way. I, I mean, again, I feel like I'm repeating myself also, but, you know, stressing the trust factor that you're, as a mentor, you're someone that the mentee should feel really confident being able to uh, be honest with and talk about their needs and anxieties and successes, uh, but also I really do think that just simply having a very sane ear <laughs> that I could that I could talk through certain issues and wonder, you know, is this reasonable what's happening? Is this entirely unreasonable what's happening? Um, just to even gauge the uh, Judith's reaction to things was very helpful. I think that Judith also. We didn't talk on the phone all the time, you know, maybe once a month, but Judith always made herself accessible if I said, you know, I really would like to touch base or I have this meeting coming up that's making me a little anxious or what should I be thinking about before we go to print fair. Uh, I think that's also important. I don't think that your mentee should become a crutch. I mean, you'll resent them at the end of this if they're just hanging on you and want you to do things for them. But I also don't think that you should come off as uh, that the mentee should feel uncomfortable or anxious about having to contact you. It's a fine balance, but I think most of the mentees are going to go out of their way to impress you rather than try and uh, harangue you. Uh, I think that's going to be the bigger hurdle is to try and 
get past the desire to appeal to you and more allow your mentorship to truly serve to mentor as opposed to be simply a cheerleader for them. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. I think that's really useful. So um, the other question is, what would you do differently if you could? Um, if you could do it all over again, is there anything you would change? And um, I would also add sort of, is there anything about the structure of the mentorship that makes it not as easy um, to succeed? Because we could potentially make changes there. Uh, I mean, I think that one thing that's very lucky for us is that we were both on the East Coast, so we were able to, you know, fly and see each other, not super expensive, meet up at the print fair. Uh, I think that it would probably be difficult to have a pairing that was cross-country maybe because it might be more expensive to be able to get together or get the time off. Uh, the one thing I would change is actually the accountability of the museums that are uh, supporting the mentees. I think that mentors can be helpful in terms of telling the mentees institution the importance of what's taking place, uh, the value of the mentorship, in order to uh, encourage the, the mentee to stay active in AAMC and encourage the institution to stay active in AAMC. I, I had a situation where uh, I was not able to go to AAMC this year because travel budget got cut, lessened. And I would have liked to be able to see Judith one more time. I would have liked to be able to go to the, the brunch and meet the other mentees and mentors. Uh, I think it should be a requirement that the museums that sponsor on both sides send their uh, successful candidates at the end of the year to AAMC. Thanks. That's useful. Judith, is there anything you would change? Um, I was very impressed. I, I thought it was extremely well considered the whole program. Um, I hadn't really even thought about this until this very moment, but this idea of getting the institution on board is an interesting one. And even from the side of the mentor, um, it could be valuable, um, perhaps in the beginning, perhaps at the end, um, the way that we filled out reports and we wrote thank you letters to um, the Tremaine Foundation, which I was happy to do, it might be valuable for your organization to send a letter to our director or something like that saying thank you and um, this was very useful. So I think that reinforces to the institution um, that this is worthwhile doing. So it, so you're not just pulling in an individual, you're trying to engage the entire institution who is maybe more apt to think about giving someone a nudge and saying, well, would you like to you know, take some time to become a mentor? Or I think this would be a good thing for you to do. Or they would at least know that maybe one that should be part of the program that's as a mentee. Right. I think that's that's true, especially, you know, if they know that they'll be gaining knowledge from another experienced curator, it could only help the institution. Um, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll talk about that as a committee. Um, so if there, I do have a couple questions from our audience. Um, I'm going to start with the first, I think this was the first one. And I think you touched on this a little bit, but did you each visit one another at your home institutions? And if so, what was the greatest benefit of those on-site visits? Do you want me to go first? Okay. Um, yes, we did. Um, and Nancy can speak to her trip to Washington. But I did go out to Worcester. You know, in a funny way, I, I could 
argue that it was a little late in the game. On the other hand, I think I had a lot of information at that point, which made the visit more valuable. Um, it was, I met the director. I also met um, Nancy's supervisor, I suppose. And in both cases, it was interesting. And, and I walked away feeling that um, Nancy had people who genuinely wanted to see her succeed, maybe in a way more strongly than she herself had seen. Um, and we're genuinely interested in sorting out how to do that um, because there's only so much staff because, you know, the, the problems are bigger than, than the easy answers. Um, but I could also see the limitations as well. But it was very useful going into her storeroom and looking at works together and talking about potential exhibitions. Um, so, and I think it, it's only fair that I would, I mean, I wouldn't feel entirely comfortable if she was always coming to me as if this were the model. Um, so it was useful to me to go to her. Mm -hmm. it, it's tough because I don't know if it's better t for the mentor to go to the mentee's institution first or vice versa. I can see the value of both. Um, yeah. I went to the National Gallery in August of last year, which is relatively soon after our, uh, our mentorship started. And at the time I was doing research on Pizarro and Boucher, and that was very helpful because you could pull all of those impressions and examples out for me at the National Gallery. I could, you know, take photographs. I could do research one-on-one -on -one with her uh, in front of objects. On the other hand, the perhaps it would have been helpful if Judith could have come to my institution first, so that if I was responding or discussing certain kinds of dysfunctionality, she would have a point of reference that she didn't have until kind of after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, I think, frankly, I think our meeting at the print fair was also one of the most concretely helpful uh, professional engagements we had. I mean, it was very, let's go to this dealer, let's talk about this thing, let me introduce you to this person. Uh, this is someone who tends to be a little bit pricey, nice stuff, a little pricey. I mean, that was just very, very helpful one-to-one -one information for me. Uh, I really I think just, in terms of, sorry. Oh, I was just going to interrupt. I, mean, I think you both, both of us would agree that the sooner you can meet each other and spend some time together, the better. Absolutely. Um, Especially since we didn't Skype, it's just very awkward to um, be confiding in someone that you have no idea who they are. It does help exactly. find each other as soon as possible. Yeah. 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 I would agree. Um, for my mentorship, I went to my mentee's institution. She ended up not being able to come to mine, again, for a budget reason. But um, we did meet in New York, and it was fabulously helpful. We both are um, area is contemporary art and we look at especially collections. Mm -hmm. um, she was rehanging her permanent collection so my getting to see her exhibition galleries and where that collection was going to be presented was helpful and then being in New York and seeing New York collections that have so much to teach us um, yes. was really helpful. It, it may be that um, a visit to each institution isn't in the end as valuable as a visit um, elsewhere. I mean, that is something to consider. I mean, is it better uh, just to meet in New York or someplace in between and walk around and go to dealers? And how much can be gained from going to the other person's institution? Um, it's an interesting question and maybe one that Mary Kay would like to discuss. I mean, maybe that sort of, that the mentor has to go to the mentee and the mentee has to go to the mentor's institution. Maybe that's not the most valuable model. Yeah, and we as a committee could look at this idea of um, travel and what 
would be the most useful type of travel for each pairing and we could you know look at that on a case-by-case -case basis so that's helpful um, and we have another couple of questions one says um, Judith can you speak to the overall time commitment that you gave as a mentor is there seems to be a bit of a concern um, when people are considering acting as a mentor um, I have to say it is a time commitment um, and the National Gallery last year um, totally unexpectedly um, <laughs> took over stewardship of the Corcoran and if I had known that we were going to have the Corcoran I probably wouldn't have chosen that <laughs> last year as the year to be the mentor yeah. you know, it wasn't overwhelming but I think the fact that I was paid to do it and I didn't even realize that I was going to be paid to do it um, and I was sort of surprised and I thought about you know shouldn't I just do this gratis I have to say in the end it did make me toe the line more carefully I mean there is some things my gosh I'm being paid to do this I better do it well and so you know I, I did sit down and write out notes every time we spoke on the phone because it's it's very memorable when it's the day after but three months down the line you can forget um, so I think if you want to do it well it is a time commitment just the way it is for the mentee mm -hmm. so I I'm not trying to discourage people from doing it I'm just saying that it's a serious responsibility. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question says, during your mentorship, did you address the issue of work-life balance? Pressures in this regard often go hand in hand with opportunities, particularly in situations such as assistant curator managing an entire department where there is a lot of opportunity but also a lot of responsibility and perhaps a lack of boundaries. So do you want to each address that? I would say that I don't think that we specifically talked about work-life balance. I wasn't, I'm not unamenable to working a lot. I just, it was very harried and unstructured. I think that, that uh, Judith brought me uh, in terms of balance, it might not have been the number of hours I'm working, it's in terms of truly, you know, prioritizing what can and cannot get done, accepting what can and cannot get done. Um, that, I think, was very helpful to me. I don't, it really wasn't about, you know, make sure you take your vacation time. It was Make sure you're, you say no to things that you really know you can't get done. Um, know what you actually can accomplish. That was more about the kind of work-life balance that we were, I think, more focused on. Mm -hmm. I think I learned from Nancy. I think she was more apt to say to me, do you have balance? <laughs> that, that, you know, or might say to me, have you had a vacation? You know, are you working? You know, why did you send this to me at 11 o'clock at night? So I think that was useful to me. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. I think uh, there is this, I think what the person asking the question was getting at, um, I've experienced, which is this idea that um, someone sees that you're hungry for opportunity, someone in your you know, at your museum or even someone near the museum that might think, oh, the museum will give us a special curatorial tour. We just have to ask the young assistant curator because she's so eager and you know, wants to impress and make a, a difference and also, you know, um, and get somewhere in her or his career. And I think that does become um, very selfless at a certain moment because you've got a lot of um, things you're trying to jockey. You know, you're, you've got your direct report that you need to impress. You've got your projects that you want to achieve and complete and do well. Um, and then 
you have people asking you to do things all the time. <laughs> I, I have. That's my next goal. I didn't get. I didn't figure that one out yet. <laughs> Is that how to say no? I admit it. I totally do that. <laughs> and, I, and you know, Joe says, can you look at this print, which is a poster that you got in 1950? Right. I say yes always, and I do have to learn to say no to those things. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Judith also just reminded me, um, Judith Pinero, that is, that for the mentors listening, that the stipends are open to the mentor's desire. And they don't stipulate it. They don't um, have to take their stipend. But I agree with you, Judith, that there's something about being paid. It's not volunteer work. It's something that you're being compensated for, and it makes you take it a little bit more seriously. Um, so I'm glad we have it. I'm glad we have our funding so that we can provide uh, both the stipend for the mentor and the travel money, which clearly was important in your pairing as well as mine. And I. I'm serving as a liaison this year, and I encouraged my pair to try to get together and visit each other's institutions as a way to, A, get to know each other, but also get to know each other's situations, and it's great for comparing notes. Um, so I don't see any other questions, but I wasn't seeing the questions. Judith Pinero, can you let me know if there have been any other ones? Um, that's it. That's all the questions so far. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, we do have another 10 minutes or so. Or if Nancy or Judith, you have anything you'd like to add? It was an excellent experience. I got a lot out of it. So I hope it was all right for Judith as well. It was. It I was. Really <laughs> enjoyed it. It was so helpful to me. You're doing very important work for the young professionals out there. Good. That, that's our goal. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining in, and thank you so much, Nancy and Judith, for taking the time and sharing your experiences and being so candid about it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.